Hi, this is Terry Couty, founder and director of Deep Sea Foundation. I'd like to welcome you to the educational channel where we talk about a number of topics related to breast reconstruction and breast surgery. I am joined today by my guest, Dr. Richard Klein, who is at the Center for Natural Breast Reconstruction in the beautiful state of Charleston, South Carolina. Welcome, Dr. Klein. Hey, how are you? I'm good. It's really good to see you again, and thanks for taking the time out to help us educate patients about these topics. And this morning, our topic is fat grafting. It's used, uh, I know, both in autologous reconstruction and in implant-based reconstruction. So we have a number of questions that come in about it, and I'm going to let you go ahead and begin the chat about it and tell us how it helps with volume, uh, contour, correction, and it's also a regenerative regenerative type. It has regenerative type capabilities. So we'll try to get all that in today. Okay, let me give a little overview of uh, fat grafting and plastic surgery and how it's evolved to where it is. And then um, you can hit me with specifics. Um, we are extremely uh, gung-ho, if you will, about fat grafting. Um, plastic surgeons tried to graft fat for many, many years um, this was like 40 years ago, were largely unsuccessful until a plastic surgeon named Sidney Coleman started um, presenting really, really good results, fat grafting initially to the face. And um, he showed you could fat graft other parts of the body. And this has slowly evolved until now we fat graft um, in breast a huge amount of the time. My partner and I, I'm sure we fat graft 200 times a year probably more as an adjunct to breast reconstruction, both implants and flaps. Initially, and initially I mean in the 90s, early 2000s, it was thought that the fat had to be processed extensively. I can't tell you how many centrifuges were purchased to process the fat. You decanted off the layer of, it looked like oil at the top and um, got rid of the aqueous layer. And we have found that all of that is completely unnecessary in our practice. And we use a large volume fat collector and we use standard power assisted liposuction. The only thing that differs from the technique that would be used for pure cosmetic liposuction is we use the cannulas with the smallest holes because we want the smallest fat particles. But otherwise we do it identically. We do a lot of multi-position harvests where we'll harvest fat with the patient on one side, then harvest fat with the patient on the other side, then inject the fat and possibly harvest more fat with the patient supine. And that lets us really focus on the cosmetic aspects of the fat harvest. So we're very, very cognizant of the fact that we're taking this opportunity to make the lower body better. Uh, this um, may augment the improvement that you get in a donor site after a DIEP flap or a gap flap, but there's almost no limits to uh, what we can do to improve the lower body with liposuction if we're harvesting fat. Now I like, um, there's a, a lot of um, techniques and devices for processing the fat. And some years ago, I um, made the leap of getting a simple stainless steel tea strainer that holds uh, about 1,300 cc's. And this will process almost a quart of fat at a time. And we take the, we take the aspirin in our container, our particular system uses about a 2,500 cc disposable plastic bucket. And when we're finished with our harvest, we put in lactated ringers or saline solution, stir it up good and let it settle. And it layers out very, very nicely. And you get some things with fat harvest that you don't like, mostly bits of fascia that are kind of firm that can clog up needles. They don't hurt anything, but they clog up the tiny fat needles. So, um, so anyway, we, we uh, mix saline or lactated ringers, stir it up good, and that lets all the particulate matter that we don't want falls down into the aqueous layer, and we decant that. So all we're left with is pretty yellow fat. And then I put that straight into a giant stainless steel um, strainer, um, which is actually made for kitchen purposes, but it probably comes as no surprise 
that good kitchen steel and good surgical steel are the same alloys because they have to be washed over and over and over again. And we believe that this minimizes the trauma to the fat. And usually we end up with very, very nice success rates. Now, what we put the fat in with, and earlier I mentioned Sidney Coleman, who did a lot of work in the 90s. This is a Coleman facial injection cannula. And you can bend it any which way. And there's one little hole on the side at the end. And we will put this in. You can imagine it's pre-curved. We might put it around the perimeter of the breast. Mm -hmm. And we put it to where we know it's exactly where we want it. And then as we withdraw it, we inject anywhere from three to five cc's of fat. So we might do this many, many, many times. But the purpose of the multiple passes is to try to get these fat particles dispersed as evenly in the tissue as possible. Because that's, that's, what I, that's what I had visualized is just this disbursement. Right. Yeah. Right. And you might make a hundred passes in some situations. Mm -hmm. If you're dealing with an implant, obviously we go around the periphery of the implant. It's very, very useful for layering the edges and improving contour. It's even more useful with a flap because you can go through and through the flap. And many times we have ultimately doubled the size of flaps with sequential back action. Mm -hmm. Now, in the 90s, the answer to how much injected fat survives on plastic surgery exams was about a third. Um, now the official answer is up to two thirds. Um, in actuality, I think two thirds is probably close to what you usually see. There are a few people, I'm just off the top of my head, I'm gonna say maybe one in 20, it seems like no fat survives for no reason. And there's a few people where I swear it all survives, which I'm sure is not impossible, but enough of it, it is impossible, but I'm sure enough of it survives enough of the time where we would really, really, really miss this if we suddenly couldn't back that. So what do we use fat grafting for? We use it for a number of things that are very, very important. Uh, we use it to, and I'm gonna talk primarily about flaps. We use it to correct size discrepancies. So usually the flaps are about the same size, but many people have noted if you're having a bilateral mastectomy, the cancer side, sometimes the general surgeon is more aggressive, understandably, that can result in that side being smaller. And fat grafting is by far the first thing we'll turn to to try to even the size and you can put fat graft through and through that flap and try to make it as large as the other flap. Another thing people uh, maybe don't think about, uh, when the general surgeon is doing the mastectomy is they're approaching the periphery of the wound and imagine this is the chest wall and this is their dissection. They can paper that dissection as skinny as they like, like coming up here. We can't paper a flap that finely because you get to a certain thickness and the periphery dies. So it's very common to have a step off of a flap and fat grafting is ideal, absolutely ideal for correcting that contour deformity. So these yes. are just- the upper, the, Smoothing out that upper pole. It is, is just wonderful. And um, it, it's just enabled us to take our results from pretty good most of the time, but almost always excellent. And mm -hmm. um, that's how good fat grafting is. Now, it doesn't pay us very much. Um, occasionally, the insurance companies fight about it. Thankfully, that's rare. But we love it because it allows us to just go the extra mile on our results, take them from good to outstanding the majority of the time. And that's why we love it. And it also lets us refine the donor areas. Um, um, you can turn, for instance, uh, I'll show you this picture. This is from uh, Perforator Atlas. Um, uh, Dr. Allen um, kind of spearheaded it. We wrote the chapter on gap flaps. This is one of our gap patients, and she's kindly lets us use her picture for almost anything. And you can see in the beginning, pre-op, she's kind of pear-shaped, and post-op, she's hourglass-shaped. And Here's her before kind of pear shape, post-op kind of hourglass shape. And we were able after harvesting her gap flaps 
number one, would get her star very high with the gap revision, but we were further able to take liposuction, refine the donor area, and we almost doubled the size of her flaps. Absolutely could not do that without fat grafting. So that's just one fairly dramatic example. Another um, thing that we constantly fight is radiation. And flaps don't care if the patient's radiated or not. That's one of the many wonderful things about flaps. But we try to save as much radiated skin as we can to keep scars from being visible, you know, in the cleavage area. But radiated skin, uh, some worse than others, is sometimes you can tell it's radiated. It can be brown. It can be leathery. And I noticed um, some years ago that some patients after fat grafting, it was like their radiated skin was just improving. It would improve in color and suppleness and softness. And then I found out I wasn't the only one who had noticed this. People started writing um, papers about fat grafting, improving radiated skin. I'm not sure anyone knows exactly why. There's um, theories that maybe some of the stem cells in the fat can differentiate and replace some things that are damaged in the radiated tissue. I don't know that that's proven, but there's absolutely no question we see this effect all the time. So we are gung-ho fat grafting. We think it's wonderful. Um, I, there's no way you can get the best result possible without incorporating fat grafting into your breast reconstruction practice. So, so the big takeaway for me today that I would like patients to really think about is the fact that you said about two thirds, roughly about two thirds, because so many ask, well, you know, I, they, they, I wasn't told or or I didn't know that uh, the amount of fat grafting that would take, I didn't know it all wasn't gonna stay. So there's that. There also is the fact of the benefits of contouring and also some of the regenerative capabilities that it has. So you explained all of those really well. The other thing I wanna comment on too really mm -hmm. quickly, cool, Dr. Klein, is the fact that you showed those pictures because you know, in breast reconstruction, you know, we are replacing a lost body part. However, you guys are plastic surgeons, you're microsurgeons, you're used to the aesthetic part of this, and it should be part of a woman's journey and what she should ask about. This symmetry can occur from transferring tissue and from transferring fat. And so that was a beautiful uh, illustration in that picture that you showed about how you really work to achieve that. So I really wanna thank you for showing that, um, that photo there. And if you can think, um, we do a lot of microsurgery, but I kind of think our microsurgical breast reconstruction on every patient, it has two phases. One is the flap transfer phase. That's pure, hardcore, nitty gritty engineering. It's high tension. We rarely lose flaps, but every case we're concerned, we might lose a flap. And um, while it's satisfying to do that work, and uh, yes, we get into a flow and kind of enjoy it, it's very stressful. But when we come back for the second and oftentimes third and subsequent cases, we've totally shifted gears. And now it's really fun because we're it's very low stress and we're getting to make the bodies as nice as we possibly can in concert with the patient's wishes. And fat grafting has really allowed us to run with that. I think that's a good way to end this video. You gave us some great information today. I truly appreciate it. If anyone has comments or questions on this video, please put them in the comment section and let us know if you have any other topics that you'd like us to cover. Dr. Klein, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh -huh.